Hi there, my name is Steve Yearhart, and this is my panel for On Con 10, which is where the otaku want to roam. Uh, real quick, I do a YouTube channel called the Unagi Observer. I talk a lot about different fandoms, but mainly I talk about anime. So if you want to check it out, please do look me up on YouTube. And um, yeah, I'm excited that OnCon is back. I always have fun making videos for, for these kinds of things. So, and this video, no less. I, I had a great time making this one. Uh, so this is about travel in anime or anime affecting travel whichever way you want to look at it. So we're going to talk about things like, um, oh, trains, because trains are everywhere in anime. Uh, we're going to talk about mascots. We're going to talk about anime impacting tourism and vice versa. And we're going to talk about, um, of course, among other things, the, you know, this little thing called a school trip to Kyoto. You know, I see that in a few anime here and there. No, it's in a lot of anime. So we're going to talk about those, those kinds of things in this panel. So before we start, just to let you know a couple things, um, since this is being shown on YouTube, I can't show actual anime clips. If I were to do that, I would shut OnCon down, and I don't want to be responsible for that. So unfortunately, no actual anime clips. Second thing is that I do live in the city, Baltimore to be precise, and you might hear some ambient noises like, oh, sirens. Um, <laughs> it's a thing. So if you hear them, don't worry about it. Um, just if you can, ignore it. Unfortunately, I have no control over that. So if you happen to hear it, just think of it as additional color to this panel. Okay, so uh, enough of that. Glad OnCon is back. Glad you're back here watching OnCon. Um, if you got any questions for me at the end, uh, please let me know, and I would love to answer them. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with Where Otaku Want to Roam. <laughs> Okay, let's start with one of the most common tropes in anime when it comes to travel, the school trip. Yes, uh, you see these story arcs all the time in anime. It's usually about two or three episodes where the school, uh, the, the class that the main characters are in, get to go on the trip, usually to Kyoto. Almost That's almost always where they wind up going uh, on a bus, on a train, whatever. There's usually a lead up with a uh, fundraising kind of thing going on to, to, to get to that trip, to, to get going. Going. and um yeah it's kind of you know you see it everywhere and you know you can see it in anime like lucky star that you know that's always a cute one k on they get a little silly there smile pretty cure um even Cromarty high school has a school trip arc in there um uh, it's it's kind of funny even the the school delinquents uh, get to go on a fun little trip, even if they get uh, a little bit of motion sickness within uh, <laughs> within the bus that they travel in. Um, but let's not confuse this with like things like summer trips. This, you know, we're talking about the overnight um, class trips, like not just like little groupings, but just like the entire class. So let's not conf confuse this with summer trips, like in Azo Manga Dayo, where uh, the summer trips where you have uh, Chio Chan. Uh, describing her fear of Hikari's driving, and then you know, fast forwarding to a scene in the house where Osaka's sleepwalking with the Santuku knife and looks like she's going to murder Yukari. Um, there's that, and also don't confuse it with a uh, Orion High, um, uh, you know, uh, club. Uh, their summer trip, uh, their actually first half of the, of the trip, losing Honey Senpai in a a um, a secluded beach area, and then once that goes wrong, they go to an actual beach, and the gang decides to see, hey, how can we uh, scare Harry? Um, and let's figure out what what she's afraid of. And then you have this horrible, horrible scene where you're just like, no, 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 this is supposed to be a rom com. Um, and also, we're not going to talk about uh, school trips that, um, you know, ends in depravity and, and bloodlust like in uh, Battle Royale. We're, we're just not going to we're just not going to go there. We're, that That's not a thing. We're, we're not going to talk about that in this section. So what we're going to talk about, uh, the example I want to use for the anime example I want to use for the school trip is, of course, the story arc in Comey Can't Communicate. So for those of you who don't know Comey Can't Communicate, it's a very lovely little anime about Comey, a high school uh, schoolgirl who has a severe shyness problem to the point that she can literally not talk to other people. She is very socially awkward. She just doesn't know how to communicate literally with anybody else. And that's kind of part of the, the, the thing of the whole series is getting her to make friends. And the first friend she makes is Tadano, 
and uh, he's helping her on this task. So on the school story arc, which is around, I believe, the uh, second season, episode 2021, 20, um, you know, they, they've gone through the, the, the sale, you know, the, the fundraiser to get the money to go to Kyoto. Cause that's where you always go. All these, these class trips go. And, uh, one of the things that you have to do on these school trips, uh, particularly in this, uh, in episode 20 is that everybody wants Komi to be in their group because Komi is this wonderfully beautiful goddess, so to speak. And everybody just loves her and thinks she's adorable and she has no way to communicate to them. So they and the idea, of course, is that people are going to mix it up. So people get out of their cliques and go into groupings that maybe they were not normally uh, be a part of. So Komi is paired up with uh, Makuni and Ayami and uh, two minor characters in the series. And these two characters look at, at Komi and they're, they're just really happy that she's part of the group. And they decide that they're going to make this the most memorable trip ever. So, of course, they go through the structure of the, the trip itself, which is to go to the Kyoto Shrine, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the Kyoto Shrine, and, you know, kind of look at the architecture and things like that. So, they're going as a school group. They have a school guide, you know, all paid for. And then, of course, they have the second day, which is their free day, which, you know, the groupings get to go out and do their own things. Well, the three girls, Makuni, uh, Ayami, and uh, Komi, decide that they, they have this packed full agenda uh, to, to get to all these different things. And one of the things that they go to is, of course, a theme park where um, somehow Comey is made up as a Mako and she's being threatened by a bunch of actors dressed up as ninja as part of the script in this theme park. And one of the girls that she's there with saves the day, so to speak, wearing an Oni mask and wielding a yo-yo. Um, you have to watch it. It's kind of funny. Um, anyway, so, you know, so this is kind of the school trip and then on their way home, they're, you know, tired and they're coming back and, and they're on the train and everyone's kind of re going through their, through their experiences on this little, uh, three day trip. And, and of course, Komi adorably falls asleep and puts her head on Tadano's shoulder, which is a wonderful way to, to end the episode. Um, but the reason why I wanted to bring this, to talk about this particular story arc is because it actually touches on a lot of actual um, things that do happen in real life when these school trips are being done. So what I find very interesting is that on a basic level, other, you know, like including the anime that, that I just showed you, um, how anime kind of gets it a little bit right in terms of how school trips go. Um, it's not that far different than what happens in real life. As part of the curriculum in, in Japanese education, the class trip is something that is normally done usually done and it is a kind of like a two night three day kind of thing um during the week and the class gets to go out on a trip um the more younger you are the more the teachers are involved in the decision making process the older the students are the reverse is kind of true so um the idea is to get the students out of the classroom and to learn things in a fashion that is uh, more fun and interesting and and probably will sink in a little bit better than just sitting in a classroom with a book and just going hey the Kyoto shrine you know that kind of stuff um so how's it work you know so basically the trip is planned like so like for example if you're in elementary school obviously your teachers and the parents are going to plan the trip and the trip is going to be very highly structured because you're elementary school kids. So, you you know, you can't be running amok, right, at that age. You, you have to have some kind of structure there. So it's very um, tightly knit. You know, you're all going to be kept together. But within your group, you're going to be encouraged to talk to other people than you normally talk to. So you get out of your clique and you talk to people. Maybe that guy you've, you've wondered about who he was and what his deal is. Maybe on this trip, this is the time you talk to that guy or, or girl. And, um, and, and maybe make a new friend. And, you know, that's part of the pro that's part of the process. And of course, you're going to go to a place where you're going to learn something. Now for the younger kids, obviously, that's going to be a easy destination, maybe a series of museums, maybe a nice uh, nature center, um, an aquarium, or you know things of that where, where kids in an elementary school setting can pr 
process that information and be still be interested and not feel like um, they're back in the classroom. But the other part of that is also how to, again, socialize with people outside of your clique, but also how to do things that are going to have real life applications for you in the future. Maintaining a schedule, um, getting, you know, understanding why you need enough sleep. That's why you go to bed at the time that you go to bed. You know, very basic things like that, but, you know, to help you structure your, to help yourself structure your own life for the future. Because while there is a lot of um, strictness and regimentality within the educational system, there's also a little bit leeway in other types of things in that system. And so you need to learn how to navigate those. And that starts in on these trips. As you grow older, uh, these trips become a little bit more different. Middle school, high school. Um, again, it's going to be, you know, two nights, three days, whatever, that kind of a thing. And, but they can be of varying topics. You, so you, it might be vocational. Uh, so you might be going out seeing a fishery. Maybe you're seeing an electrical plant. Maybe um, you know you you go to a university where they talk about disaster um, disaster relief, how how to combat the um, you know tsunamis and things like that. And you take trips from the university to these places where you see the walls and and things like that. Um, you know, so it it can be very very. Um, instructive. You can also also have things that are cultural, um, and you know that's you know we're talking about the Kyoto Shrine trips, right? You know that we all see in anime. You know, time to go to Kyoto. Um, but it can also be about history because Japan has a huge amount of history. There are probably footbridges in Japan older than the United States of America, so it's a lot. And but in within with that, you know, you can also learn other things like how are these shrines built? How do they get the wood there? How is how are they um, 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 sanctified? And how you know how the priests work? You know, what's the difference between a Buddhist and a Shinto shrine? Things like that. So you know, you learn things, cultural things, historical things. But as you're doing that, you also have a little bit of leeway as students. You you kind of are in charge a little bit of planning how the trip goes and usually at that age you can throw in a little you know day trip to the uh, to the to the amusement park for a couple hours uh you know that might be a thing um as we see in anime so a little bit less regimented by the parents and the teachers that are in charge of the group but still enough guidance there so that they don't totally run amok because that's also not something you want to learn oh yeah here by the way here's a un unlimited amount of freedom and we're not going to do anything to teach you how to behave in the world and just go out there and run amok no that's not how that works there is still some rules that have to be followed and things like that um so i just find it you know you know, you know when i first watched anime and we have the idea you know was first started seeing these episodes about the school trips and i'm just kind of like I wish we could do that. I wish I could have done that. And it's just, you know, again, it's kind of like, well, you know, in Japan, things are a little bit different where you can do those kinds of things, whereas here in America, not so much. Um, but yeah, so that's the idea of the school trip, um, you know, both in real life and in anime. So, if you know your anime history, then you know that the first animes that came out in, um, you know, the late 50s, early 60s, were tied to toy companies. The toy company said, I have a giant robot thing, and I want kids to buy it. I want the parents of the kids to buy it. So, can you make an animation with this toy in mind? And the studio said, sure, give us money, and we will do the thing. And a lot of anime was created in that manner. Now, we fast forward to today, and we find that an anime is everywhere, and it can sell anything. Um, it can sell a restaurant, it can sell a train, it can sell, um, you know, goods, uh, uh, t uh, not just toys, but, you know, maybe, you know, certain types of games. Um, it can sell, like, for example, I, I back a few years ago, um, a company 
and it, actually, I think it was an Italian company that that canned sardines, but they licensed from original Gundam Char Ensemble's face with the mask, and they just plunked it on the top of the tin right next to their to the title of their company. And I wanted that tin, and I never got it, by the way. But um, but that's the point. Like it's like, oh, here's a thing you like. Here's an anime you like, and we're gonna put its face on this thing in the hopes that you go oh, i like that anime and you know product placement and there we go you know give me the thing give me give me give me give me um so it that that's how it works for tourism so a lot of tourism can be you know destination like for example uh you know there might be a popular anime where they use an actual real life scenery backdrop and it's used in the anime and so you have a destination of hey here's the thing in that anime you like so come by and and spend some money on us uh other times they will uh commission uh tourism boards will commission uh an actual little anime um probably about five or six episodes um no more than four or five minutes and it's a way to showcase in a fun fashion um what your city is, what your town is, what your shrine is, what your museum is, you know, why, why should you come here? Here's the anime that says to you, come here and this is why. And so they would commission those things or maybe commission a mascot in the anime manga styles, uh, make their own little characters, their, their own little thing that, that exists for their town or, or destination. So you have all those things. So what I would like to do in this section is throw out at you some mascots uh because some of these guys are really hilarious some of them a, a lot of most of them are actually very very specific in what they are trying to sell what they're trying to get you to do um and there's one in particular that just it cracks me up every time i see this guy um <laughs> i can't wait to show you uh so there's that and of course i want to show to you guys a destination of sorts actually it's not just one destination it's a number of destinations a grouping of them that have to do with gundam yes original gundam destinations um you know we you know what i'm talking about I'm talking about the giant robot uh so yeah so there are places in japan which showcase these the gundam so i want to talk about that a little bit here in this section and also want to point out that a lot of this stuff for the tourism board, uh, a lot of, you know, the reason why they do this is not so much to get people from outside of Japan to come to Japan to do the thing. That's a whole different marketing thing. This is for Japanese. This is really for people who live within Japan, but who maybe never leave their area. You know, it's like the school trips again, like the school trips. You know, um, here's an anime to show you why you should come to our place to bring your kids. Um, it's, you know, to get you out of the city to go to a wonderful resort. Uh, maybe it's for you that lives in rural Japan to come to Sendai or Tokyo or, you know, a lot of people go, I don't want to go to Hokkaido. It's so cold up there. So you're going to have, you're going to have, you know, characterizations and anime, anime manga characterizations up there that's, that would entice you to come to Hokkaido, particularly Sapporo. I actually really do want to, uh, side note, I, I really do want to visit Sapporo at one point. And not just because of the beer, well, you yeah, know, a little bit for the beer. But it's, you know, again, there's a lot of stuff that's going on out there, but we wouldn't know about it until we actually see these things. So tourism, anime and tourism is, is really important. So, so I'm going to stop with that right now and I'm going to start showing you some mascots and we're going to talk about Gundam as a destination. So as we can see, mascots are very, very important to businesses and tourism because they are interrelated. So let's take a look at some of the mascots that we have here. Some of these, the, you know, some of the popular ones. Um, and let's start off with Domo-kun. Uh, he pretty much um, showed up in 1998 to uh, mark the 10th anniversary of the broadcast stations NHK being on satellite broadcast. So here they put up this plushy little, plushy little monster. Uh, he lives in a cave with a couple bats, and uh, you know he just does these little things in a sotto voce voice, which is um, Italian for uh, for loud whisper, which only certain people can really understand. 
and he makes for a great plushie. He is so merchable. Uh, there's so much merch on him out there, and when he shows up, you definitely know who he is. He is often used as filler between programs on NHK. So, yeah, this, this guy is everywhere. Uh, even if you didn't know that he was a mascot for NHK, I'm sure you have seen him on the internet already. He's, he's everywhere. Now, this oddball is called Funashi. So, Funashi is, um, well, it's a pair. And it's a pair fairy, to be, to be precise. Uh, it, uh, it, its parents are, were ordinary pear, pear trees. But Funashi is, is the fourth of 274 children. And according to Wikipedia, it, it, its birthday is July 4th. And as of this year, it'll probably be 1,886 years old. Um, there you go. He, it, he, it, she, whatever you want to call it, um, loves heavy metal, apparently, and its favorite food is peaches, of all things. So it goes after other fruit. Huh, interesting. Okay, so uh, <laughs> he runs around, screams, and, you know, headbangs and things, and end sentences with, you know, screaming nasty. Um, a very vocal, kind of moving around character. Uh, and he is the unofficial not official, mind you, unofficial uh, mascot of Funabashi City in Chiba. And this is kind of interesting because this was a, this is uh, definitely a mascot that was created by a Funabashi uh, citizen who has a retail establishment and was trying to drive business for the city and for himself. So he kind of came up with this character uh, to help advertise his business. Um, but it grew and grew and grew and grew. And apparently Funashi is uh, in a whole bunch of uh, CDs, DVDs, a whole bunch of TV programs and commercials. So he's everywhere. And this is just an odd-looking thing. And, and I've seen a video of it, and it really is kind of almost off-putting on how crazy this little mascot is. But he's doing the job. He's, 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 he's getting people to Funa uh, Funashi. is getting people to come to Funabashi Chiba. So, you know, there you go. Let's hear it for the uh, pair fairy. So you've probably seen this guy everywhere, Kumamon. So he is the mascot for Kumamoto Prefecture, for the whole thing, the whole shebang. He is uh, so cute that he makes a crap ton of money <laughs> for the prefecture. So he is widely distributed everywhere. I mean, you can see him on T-shirts, hoodies, keychains, gachapon, uh, the whole nine yards. I mean, this guy is just very, 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 very popular. Came about in uh, 2011, you know, just to, you know, or thereabouts, just to, you know, just say, hey, come to Kumado. We have a cute bear image mascot thingy. And people bought into it. Um, so aside from making a lot of money, a lot of merch, uh, he actually does have a sort of mission of sorts. You can see him often uh, in places where there are first responders, kind of like uh, people who fight forest fires or police or firemen, things of that nature. And he sort of a, a, a espouses a safety program of, sport, of of sorts in addition to promoting Kumamoto uh, Prefecture and the various things that go on in there. So, yeah, this guy, uh, wow, this guy is an incredible money. So this is probably my favorite mascot, uh, Nyanga Star. And he came about because in uh, Kuroshi City, uh, which is basically a farming community, uh, they grow a lot of apples. They are they have a very low population and population and the economy is suffering as a result of it. So uh, they're trying to figure out what to do. And apparently there's a person who lives there who is a very capable drummer, uh, particularly metal drummer. And uh, he had donned the mascot suit of Neon Ghost Star. Now, the lore behind Neon Ghost Star is that um, he is the reincarnation of a cat that had been buried in a apple orchard. And when he was reincarnated, he was reincarnated into this apple cat. And hence the, the, the way the mascot suit is, is created. And he uses his drumming skills to try to bring about people to, to come to the city to Kuroshi city to you know spend time there to have some tourism spend money that whole all nine yards to help the city come back so to speak um 
this guy is also everywhere. Uh, if you go on YouTube and you just type in Niango, N-Y-A-N-G-O, star, you're going to see a lot of videos of him uh, playing children's venues and then suddenly going into a heavy metal riff on his drums. And he looks so angry when he does it. It makes me laugh. Um, anyway, so this is uh, you know a really good example of why a mascot exists. Uh, you know, they're they're there to help, kind of so to speak. And so this guy do, has done a lot for Kuroshi City, and um, he's just very very entertaining to watch. And I I, I got to tell you, if I was in Japan and I happened to notice he was going to be nearby, I would so go and and watch this and watch this mascot play. It's it's just a it really is a joy to watch. So let's wrap up this section about mascots and their impact on tourism with a very well-known anime mascot. Yes, that's right, folks. We're talking about the Gundam, the 18-meter tall RX-78F00 Gundam in Gundam Factory, Yokohama. Um, this wonderful thing was uh, built uh, to be to be displayed in conjunction with the 2020 Tokyo Olympics in October of 2020. Unfortunately, of course, as we all know, COVID was a problem, so it didn't really get to open until a little bit later in December of that year. But um, we ha- we got to have it for a little while, and um, unfortunately, by the time that this um, panel is going to air, it will have closed on March 30 th- 31st. 2023 after a couple delays of closing it simply because it's so wildly popular i mean here's this 18 meter tall thing that actually moves it's a mecca that moves i want it so much i i literally just would love to go to japan and steal it and have it here in baltimore that would be awesome having a gundam in baltimore wouldn't that be cool i think it would be cool anyway so this was created, of course, to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Gundam, uh, Gundam franchise, which is, of course, wildly popular. Even if you've never seen the series, you know what Gundam is, and this thing is amazing. Now, because of the fact that it is part of a hugely popular, fan, or well-known at least, franchise, this draws a lot of buzz and a lot of attention. So, even though it's closed now, it is rumored that it is going to be dismantled and then re and then repurposed in Osaka to do the same thing. So here, so this might be a traveling thing to help with, um, you know, the economy, local economies. So th- that w- that's kind of cool, I think. So anyway, yes, Gundam RX seven eight F zero zero Gundam. Would you like to have one? <laughs> If we're talking about travel in anime, we would be certainly remiss if we said nothing about, yep, you guessed it, Japan's pride and joy, trains. Okay, so we see trains everywhere in anime and manga. They are sometimes even part of the story. Maybe a person gets isekai'd via a train. Maybe they get hit by a train or they're on a train and something hits the train. A, maybe another train, a truck, a plane. Who knows? Uh, you know, anything's possible with an isekai. Or it could be the setting of a rom-com where two strangers bump into each other and, and, and then sparks fly. And then that starts off the, the, the whole will they, won't they kind of story. Um, it can be the the plot point of of a of of a story where they're trying to prevent a friend or a loved one from getting hit by a train and they're jumping around in time you know what movie i'm talking about and uh you know things of that nature so we we see it everywhere it's it's everywhere in in japanese animation it's sometimes it's just the background sometimes it's it's part of the story sometimes it can even be a character in the story a non-sentient character but a character nevertheless so Let's go ahead and let's start talking about trains. And I just want to give a you know quick little history of trains in Japan because it's actually not a very long history lesson. Okay, so the history of rail in Japan is pretty short. Um, you know, it, it really starts uh, to gain steam and traction in 1872 when the uh, Meiji Restoration is well on its way to modernize Japan. But the thing is, is that actually the idea of creating railways 
actually existed before the Meiji Restoration, during the Tokugawa period, granted towards the end of it before the uh, war to take out the Tokugawas happened. Um, the Tokugawas actually wanted to create a rail line that went from basically Kyoto to Edo. And they wanted that rail line just so that they can go between the two, two capitals, so to speak. And uh, it never obviously came to fruition, but a lot of Europeans had come by and kind of showed off, you know, here's what a steam engine looks like. Here's what it looks like if it's going on rails. Um, there was a German demonstration, I believe. There was a demonstration from Scotland. Um, uh, and um, the Dutch also brought over schematics while they still had Deshima and said to the Japanese, hey, wouldn't you like to have this technology? Of course, it was the Tokugawa period, so things moved at a glacial pace. Now, once, of course, the Meiji Restoration happened, things got a little bit more quicker. And so it wasn't so much as we're going to build the rail, rail line between points A and B. It was more along the lines of where do we build these rail lines? So they were really, really interested in building um, a network of rail um, within uh, within Honshu, Japan. And what they settled on for the first um, first rail line uh, happened to be t between um, Shimbashi, uh, Tokyo, and Sakaguchiyo. Um, sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, it's the first rail line. Uh, it, it took a, a few hours to go from one place to the other, but they had nine daily uh, trains going back and forth. So once they realized, oh, this is kind of good, we can travel from here to there fairly quickly, um, instead of walking or riding a horse or riding it in, in, in a wagon or whatever, um, people realized, you know, this is a good thing. What's uh, kind of interesting, though, just as a side note, is that one of the proponents of the Meiji Restoration, one of the main um, um, generals, um, um, Saigo Takamori, this guy, um, he, is the, uh, he is the guy that The Last Samurai is based on, loosely, very loosely, the Tom Cruise movie that's incredibly historically inaccurate but anyway um he didn't like trains like he liked the all the modernization of warfare but he just didn't like trains for some reason um so he was always against them why what did he have against trains anyway um so the meiji restoration and particularly emperor meiji said okay we're gonna do the thing and as a result um german and american engineers came to japan and again did more demonstrations and saying this is the kind of rail um, gauge lines that you're going to want to use here's the kind of steam engines you want to make here's what you're capable of doing and they so forth and so on and they started creating um a, a template for a limited network of rails within honshu japan and it it worked. Um, so it worked so well that after the Japanese-Russian uh, War, 1905, uh, the Japanese military kind of said, hey, you know, what would have really helped is if we had these trains shuttling all this material and equipment and and men and all this stuff to get to the front more quickly. We, we You know, this would have been really good to use, and it actually probably is good for our national defense. As a result, all these little rail lines all over Honshu, Japan, became nationalized. What that means is that the government basically more or less took them over. And the idea, of course, is not only to, to create a, a military strategy based on these rail lines, but also, you know, just to kind of unify service, kind of um, regulate it into, into to one policy, so to speak. And as a result, that worked for a very long time. That worked very well, actually, for the Japanese in uh, leading up to World War II, particularly with being able to get things from the factories to the ships to China, to um, uh, Korea, to Vietnam, wherever it was that they were going to be. And, of course, it also helped with fighting with Americans in the South Pacific, uh, being able to get that material out. Um, so rail lines were, were very instrumental and targets of the military, the U.S. military. So once the rail system was more or less destroyed, um, you know, they had to rebuild after 1945, and they did. And after a while, it became more of a commuter service, you know, within cities. So the trains became subways. They became trolleys. They became um, more for civilians than government um, workers, so to speak. And they were able to get people from outside of the city to suburbia 
and even out into the world, out into the into the sticks. And the people in the sticks were like, hey, I can actually get to Kyoto, Tokyo, Tokyo, Sendai, wherever, on a train. Instead of taking days to get there, I can get on this train and be there in a matter of hours. So it was a really big deal. And then something happened. They The, the, the Japanese government just said, you know, we can do this up to a point. We can nationalize this up to a point. But if we're going to improve our technology, we're just going to have to let some of these rail lines go public, go private, that kind of a thing. And that's how Shinkansen came about. Uh, once you, these private companies came into being, they owned their own rail lines. As a result, they could you know, do their own R&D and create faster and faster and faster trains to what we have today, the bullet trains, the Shinkansen. And so there's, yeah, kind of brief, a very brief history of trains in Japan. And you can see how, like, some of these trains, as I talk about these, some of these lines coming up, um, you can you can almost see them in the anime. And you can understand why anime, Japanese anime, has trains all the time. When you think about um, American animations or other uh, animations from other countries, yeah, the trains show up. Yeah, you know, sometimes they have a scene or two in it. But they're not everywhere in the animation in anime they are truly everywhere and i think it's just because there was a national um sense of urgency to have this network of lines and to create it and to make it um so efficient that's the other part of it so so efficient and um so why wouldn't you have it in in, in anime so for the next part here we're going to talk about some rail lines real life rail lines that are connected to anime so the first train based on an anime is going to be based on the and pan man anime uh this is a superhero with a red bean paste for a head and he flies around does good he, he's a servant of justice he fights an evil bacteria on an episode to episode basis and of course he always wins a wonderful children's anime that is still popular today as a really really long run and uh, yeah, so they have trains with his likeness on it. Um, there's actually three different lines. The Yosan line, the Dosan line, the Kotoku line. And, um, you know, each train has its own thing going on, its own kind of visuals, characters. And on the inside, they have a wonderful uh, um, themed messaging, you know, like when they're announcing the next stop, they're done in the voices of the characters. And it's just a fun little thing for, for kids when they're on a long train ride. Okay, so this isn't really technically anime, I guess, but anime adjacent. Um, this is Hello Kitty Shinkansen. Yes, a bullet train to the to the stylings of Hello Kitty. Um, it's very interesting. I hope you like the color pink because it is very pink on the outside and in the inside. And of course, J.R.L. Pass says this is the cutest bullet train ever. Um, you can see kind of like how things are, are looking in here. You have little play areas. You have just very, very pink things going on but if you're a hello kitty fan and you need to get to a place from a to b really really quickly um you know here's here it is the hello kitty shinkansen <coughs> excuse me so it has an interesting history though um prior to being the hello kitty um shinkansen it was the evangelion shinkansen <laughs> yes so we went from evangelion to hello kitty um you know, that, that's kind of a whiplash right there. But anyway, so there you go. The uh, cutest Shikinson, um in Japan. Hello Kitty. So I'm not certain if the, the real-life Mugen train is still active, but I just wanted to bring it up. Even if it, it isn't still active, it was just a neat concept to have an actual steam locomotive based on trains from the Taisho era um, actually running and doing a Mugen theme train thing so there you go i just wanted to mention that show it out there throw it out there and if anybody knows whether or not this is actually uh still running um let us know in the chat thanks so last but certainly not least is the pokemon train yes pokemon and actually this is part of the uh concept of the joyful train um ride experience so this isn't really so much of a, of a, a um a transport like a lot of the other trains that are themed this is actually its own line so it's a very short line it's between 40 and 50 miles 
Um, it has about anywhere from five to seven stops on it. And uh, the idea is that you are having an experience on the train. So it's usually a two car train like this one. And the first one of the cars is, you know, you travel on it. You, you sit there and you have your kid who loves Pokemon and loves Pikachu. And you better love Pikachu because this train is nothing but yellow and brown. So, you know, just, just to warn you. And, um, yeah, so you can sit there and have a an experience there and let the kids run amok in the other car where it is definitely Pikachu um, themed and there's a whole bunch of play areas. And it just seems like a fun little thing to do, especially if you're like me and you have a niece who is really, really into Pokemon. So, yeah, there you go. It's, uh, I kind of want to ride it. I do. I'm not, I'm not a huge Pokemon fan, but, you know, why not? Why the heck not? So far, we've talked about anime that uses the actual idea of the school field trip, the overnight school field trip, as a story construct within the anime. You know, a lot of animes have that, um, you know, we're all going on a school trip to Kyoto uh, story arc, usually only two or three episodes. But it's a neat way for to use travel in anime to bring forward minor characters or characters you don't see that very that often in the anime itself and and bring them all together and kind of give them a little bit of the the limelight so to speak and uh where they create uh friends and you get to be more interested in these characters you ordinarily wouldn't have too much time with during during the course of the series so you know there you go there's that and then we talked about um, anime tourism and um, uh, more specifically how anime is used for tourism you know to, to get people interested in coming to your prefecture to your town to your farm to your brewery yes there are breweries in japan that i would like to go to um and trying to create an anime because that is something that is why a medium that is widely used to disseminate information in a fun way and then of course you know as a result of that we get those quirky mascots that i love so much um so let's talk about a kind of a lesser known um aspect of travel within anime by by bringing up a certain genre of anime that that um people definitely do enjoy but these type of anime which are called healing anime usually bring about a process it, it talks about how um through the course of the story the main character is involved in a hobby or a thing that requires learning uh, proficiency uh, equipment and things of that nature and and making friends around that and then moving forward with a goal in in these healing animes they're they're very relaxing they're fun to watch there's a certain amount of joy of of watching someone being able to make a mug right you know sometimes you just that's all you want to watch sometimes you don't need a violent isekai sometimes you just need somebody working with clay in this case we're going to talk about two particular anime that involve travel in some way shape or form uh the first one is more about um taking care of uh, uh specific equipment to get yourself transported from A to B, and that's going to be Super Cub, all right? And then the next one, of course, we're going to talk about is one that I think you all might know. You might know it. I'm not sure. not 100% sure, but you might know this little thing called Laid Back Camp. So let's, uh, so let's go ahead and start and talk about healing anime in travel. <laughs> All right, for the healing anime in travel, let's start off with Super Cub. This is a cute little um, anime. It started off as a series of novels, went into a series of light novels, turned into a manga, and then, of course, turned into the aforementioned um, anime, which is what I know of Super Cub. Um, it is delightful. It's sad at first. Uh, we are dealing with Koguma, who is a very lonely person. She's by herself. There's no parents. There's a stipend, a very limited stipend that she has. So where she's staying at is very, very bare bones, bland, not much to look at, right? So she gets on her bike and she rides to school every day. She has to, you know, she's pretty much far enough away that she needs to have that kind of transportation. One day as she's biking by herself, you know, a, a super cub, a guy on a super cub drives past her and she's just like, huh. Eh, that could make life a little bit easier for me if I had that. And she goes on the process of getting the Super Cup. So she, <clears throat> by herself, is having to learn how to go through this process. Now, 
of course, she goes to the dealership and she goes, I need a used one, the cheapest one. And he, and he points one out to her and says, okay, this thing has killed three people. Um, it didn't, but, you know, that's the story. But anyway, um, she goes, okay, well, I'll buy it because it's cheap. And then he helps her out a little bit. He's nice and he's just like, okay, this is what you need to do. You're going to need to get a license. So this is kind of important in, in healing anime in, in which that they show you a process and they kind of go through, take you through uh, in, in a relaxed way, in a way that doesn't cause you a lot of stress, but just here's a person going through life doing the thing that they want to try and accomplish. And for her, it's getting her license so she can drive the, the Super Cub back and forth to her apartment to school. So she goes through this process and you know he he shows her the 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 owner's manual and and she you know reads through it and she's diligent and you know of course she has to pay for uh the not only the, the bike but also to take the exam to prove herself worthy of the bike now when you do travel and you go to places sometimes you're required to qualify yourself for a um for being able to use a type of car, a type of vehicle, or a or, or proving that you can actually hike that trail, that that level, that high level trail, um, things like that. So this is no different. She has to prove by getting the license that she can actually get on the Super Cub and drive it. So she does it. She does the thing. Yay! First step completed. And she goes to school, and. Um, or one night she, she's looking at it and she goes, you know, I kind of want to take it for a joyride. And she takes it for a joyride <clears throat> and it stops. And she has no idea what's going on. She's looking at it. She's checking things. She, she really doesn't know what she's doing. Until finally she's like, I should probably take a look at the owner's manual. And it tells her that there's a reserve tank of gas that should get her to the next gas station. It does. She fills it up. She's happy again. Lesson learned. So in this anime, she learns how to not only to qualify, how to safely ride this thing, but also learns a little bit about mechanics. And then she starts driving to school. And there's a couple other girls that are like, hey, I, I've got one too out here. And the rest of the anime is them kind of exploring, you know, how to use the super code, how to travel. There, there are... Um, times where she is feels challenged that you know someone says a super cup can't do this like taking items like very fragile items from one place to another she goes oh no no no, no. I, I know how to do this i can do this and she does the thing and in doing so of course she has to make things um she has to make a rig or get help making a rig so that she can actually carry these things um another point of traveling of using um super cubs as travel there are other things that, that she and her friends have to figure out. Like, for example, if they want to drive in winter, you're not just going to get on your bike and just go and just put on a jacket and go, right? You know, because you're going to be cold. So they learn how to do things like knit their own blankets, uh, gloves, uh, you know, scarves and things like that to winterize themselves to be able to go forward during winter and, and do the trek. And then they also realize that they have to do things mechanically to winterize also their super cups. And so that's a very interesting, very interesting thing. And then you have the joy of being able to do these things, of being able to get on your bike and maybe not just doing a challenge, but being with your friends and going out there and having a good time. And that's the whole point of Super Cub. You know, here's this very, very lonely girl who just does, has literally the title of the first episode is the girl who has nothing. She literally has nothing. And now she has so much. She's you know, relatively wealthy, if you will. And part of this is that joy in being able to take care of something, of a, of a piece of equipment, in this case a Super Cub, that enables you to travel. So they're able to make trips during the winter. They can go on summer vacation. They can do um, actual work with these things. So this is a very, very nice way of seeing travel in anime in a very practical sense and in a way that shows hey, you know, you can have fun with these things, but you have to take care of them. You have to learn how to use them. You have to learn how to be safe with them. And most importantly, you have to learn how to enjoy them with other people. And um, if you haven't seen Super Cub, I hope this description of it and the way that they travel around uh, locally in, in their town 
um, and in the immediate environs. I hope that makes you want to watch it because Super Cub really is a cute little little healing anime. Um, so enough of Super Cub. We're going to go on to, yes, Laid Back Camp. <laughs> Laid Back Camp, one of the most well-known and loved healing animes out there. Um, it's all about camping. It's all about girls going out and camping. And like most healing animes, it's procedural. It, tells you, it teaches you things. It shows you things. It shows you how, what kind of equipment to take, what kind of things to do, how to figure things out. And not only does it do that, but it shows you a nice little story about Rin, who wants to be alone and likes camping by herself one or two nights you know, every now and again, and she's very well prepared. And she knows what she's doing. Then there's Nadeshko, who becomes her friend, who is a noob and knows absolutely nothing. And so it starts off with this pair learning, uh, Rin teaching Nadeshko how to camp. And then Nadeshko, surprisingly, being able to offer a camping skill, which is to cook, which is kind of really neat. Um, you know, a lot of people don't think about cooking and camping. So, um, and the dash coat brings that to the table, no pun intended. Um, so then the rest, of course, the anime is about Rin opening up a little bit more, gathering more friends, the dash coat learning more and becoming more uh, enamored of the camping life and bringing in their friends and creating a club and doing the thing. Uh, it's a relatively short series. I believe it's, um, you know, two seasons, but, you know, each season is kind of on the short side. And if you want to, you there's actually a video game that you can play um, with, uh, with Laid Back Camp. So, yeah, there's that. So what is the big deal about um, Laid Back Camp in terms of being a travel anime? Okay, so first of all, Rin knows of places to go to in Japan or at least in her immediate environs. One of the places she likes to go to a lot is Mount Fuji. Now, what's interesting about this anime is that they will actually do background shots that are real, in real uh, that, that you can see in real life. Like there's a place that she goes, uh, a field that people can camp at and see Mount Fuji. And there are certain landmarks that she visits and they are there in real life and they kind of look like what's how they're drawn in the anime. And I thought that was really kind of cool. There's uh, one, one part where she goes by a pond and that reflects Mount Fuji on there. And then you come to find out that there is that pond and it does reflect Mount Fuji. So, you know, that's kind of a neat thing to be able to go, you know, because one of the things about some animes is that you can actually go to some of the places like in the anime tourism um, and actually look at these places and go, oh my gosh, it's, it's here. It's actually here. Um, so there's that. And it's kind of a fun thing to know that those things actually exist, that the, the people who made this anime were just like, going, no, this is a real thing. And isn't it cool, you know, that, that we can show you this. And, but more to the point, Rin, um, understands when she goes to, uh, various places, she's got a budget in mind. You know, she's just like, okay, how much firewood do I have to buy? Um, who do, do I, how much does this, does a place, a, a, a site cost me? How much is this going to cost me? How much can I get away with it, with paying as little as possible? And so she goes to these places and then you have a narrator who's kind of fun, who kind of explains and says, okay, this is the type of equipment that she uses. Now here in America, I used to work for Eastern Mountain Sports. So I used to do camping and rock climbing, um, uh, back in the day. But, um, so there are Kind of, it was kind of neat to see equipment being used in laid back camp that I used to sell and used to use myself. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of those things was actually so that you don't hurt the ground because some of these places are biodiverse and you need to take care of them. You need to have an actual platform with which to put your firewood on top of and burn it that way so that you don't burn the ground. You don't burn the, any plants that might be um, rare or unique to the area and things of that nature. And it's just kind of neat to see those kinds of care and and um, and kind of rules that say you need to do this or else don't make a fire. Um, they describe the types of tents that you want to have out there. You know, if it's summertime, you know, there are certain types of tents. If you're a one person, it can be a really tiny tent that just, 
you know, keeps the mosquitoes away and keeps you comfortable, but then you, you know, keep tracking or you can have a tent like Rin where it's like a place to be. So for Rin, when she's going out camping, even though there are other people far enough away, there are people there. So it's not like she's out in the wilderness alone with the mountain lions and stuff, right? So she's doing, she's camping within her means, within her skill set. And it's kind of neat to see how, um, what equipment she uses, how she uses it, and how she uses her time, which is to sit in a chair, read odd conspiratorial conspiracy theory books, and listening to really kind of cool, easy music to listen to, kind of kind of um, hippie chick music, if if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. And but as we go on with the series, when the club starts to begin, they talk about budgets. They talk about what kind of um, what kind of, uh, of sleeping bags do you use? And a lot of people don't know that in sleeping bags, they are rated. So you're not going to use a winter sleeping bag during summer. That's too much. But you're going to want that winter rated sleeping bag because it's going to be lighter and it's going to keep you warm. Uh, so, you know, you need that certain type of rating. And they go through that. They teach you how in this series, how to look at things and judge what you need and what you need to budget for. So, um, you know, so, and one of the things that they teach you is that you want to pack light. Odds are you're going to have to walk from one point to another to the campsite. And that's usually how it works. And in doing so, you're going to want to be, you don't want to be like overburdened, right? You know, just like, a, you know, like in an actual, you know, cartoon where you know that thing's going up behind you, you know, your backpack is like twice the size you are with a pan on the top right and so you don't want to do that so when you create a club and you and you gain friends you realize Rin realizes I can share the cost with people I get to have a good time with these people and we can all share the load Nadeshko teaches that to her by being there and cooking and so she provides food she goes okay this is what I can bring out here because this is what I could carry this makes sense I don't have a rice cooker but I know how to do these things and so instead of eating a, just a little cup of ramen you know on her trips out now Ring gets these wonderful dishes that Nadeshko makes and they all they, they honestly really do look good in, in the anime so this is another type of healing anime where you know we should we learn how to do the thing we learn how to camp and camping is a part of travel and i just think it's just a wonderful way of showing people how to do something in a non-stressful way um instead of like you know camping as a sport you know will they go to nationals and camping i, mean, I don't know is there a sport like that <laughs> who knows probably is um but it teaches you in a way much like super cup where you have to qualify, you have to learn things, you have to do things, you have to rely on other people to do these things. But more importantly, you get to go out there. You get to go out in the wild and see the thing. You can see Mount Fuji, you can you can ride a bike on, on roads, you can um, travel with friends, create memories, and have a good time. And I just love these two animes, uh, Super Cub and, and uh, Laidback Camp, because they embody that so perfectly well. Um, again, if you haven't seen either of these or one of these, uh, anime, please, please do. Cause, um, you gotta be careful cause you might learn something. Um, which is kind of the whole point. So yeah, there's healing anime, travel and healing anime as a part of traveling around in the world. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching my panel where Otaku went to Rome, which was about anime impacting travel and travel impacting anime. Uh, I hope you found it informational or you just enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I hope you learned a thing or two. Um, be careful. Learning can be dangerous. <laughs> anyway, uh, again, thank you for watching. And I hope you have a great rest of the OnCon. We've got a lot more panels coming up. And they are really some cool ones too. Um, can't wait to watch them myself. But I am also looking forward to your questions momentarily. So I uh, hope to see you there. But in the meantime, as we say, um, watch more anime.